This episode and others like it are made possible by the generous support of my patrons on Patreon. We just did a major overhaul of our patrons-only Discord server, so if you'd like to join our growing community and get early access to every video, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash second thought. Remember January 6th? Of course you do. Remember, it was the day Antifa did everything Trump supporters had said they would be doing for months, did it exactly the way they'd been planning and telling all their friends they'd be doing it in online forums, did the whole thing while wearing MAGA shirts, waving Confederate flags, and having the names and faces of long-standing Republican voters grafted onto their own Mission Impossible style, and then Antifa chivalrously took none of the credit for it. Wow, what a memorable time in American history that was. It's been almost a year, or exactly one year, or, or just a little more than one year, I, I, I don't know, I'm writing this in December. Let's just say it's been about a year since the weirdest day in recent American history, and in the meantime, things haven't been super fun. The far right seems like it's continuing to grow in power and in influence under the Biden admin. And in this episode, we're going to be looking at that a little more closely, because it is a troubling omen for the future of politics in this country. Let's get started. The first thing I should address is the title of the video, the idea that fascism is on the rise in the US. That's a pretty obvious statement for most people, and likely even more so for the audience I have on this channel. Fascism has been on the rise for a while, so much so that it's made that very statement the topic of countless op-eds, and not too long ago, the most powerful government seat in the world was filled by the unwitting culmination of that trend. For four years, the United States was ruled by a man who repeatedly parroted fascist narratives, cozied up to white supremacist organizations, and used armed forces and a militarized police to quash anti-fascist protest movements. And those are just some of the many, 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 many other telltale signs of fascism. There are just so many. I'm not going to spend more time on this already tired argument of whether Trump is a fascist, a proto-fascist, a neo-fascist, or not a fascist at all, haha <laughs> don't worry about it, because you've had over four years of that and we're all sick of it. This video is about how the US as a whole is getting fascister, even more fascisty? How America is doing big fash. But just so it's out of the way, I'm going to be using the same definition of fascism I've used before, palingenetic ultranationalism. Palingenetic meaning a belief in and a desire for the violent rebirth of a nation to overcome a period of moral decay, and ultranationalism meaning an overwhelming loyalty to a perverted vision of one's country, often laced with bigotry and racism. There is more to fascism than that, and it varies by the culture in which it appears, but since we're talking about big trends in our common discourse, defining fascism by its core ideology like this is actually pretty useful. So with all that in mind, let's go back to January 6th. That day was a real turning point for the American far right, particularly in the months that followed it. On the one hand, it was the first time in several years that crackdowns had targeted white nationalists and their friends so aggressively. As I'm writing this, over 700 people have been arrested and charged for the acts committed on the day of the riots, and several trials are ongoing to identify central figures and prosecute them. Groups like the Proud Boys, who were involved in the event and reached superstar status in 2020 after this infamous clip. Stand back and stand by, but I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, somebody's got to do something about Antifa and the left, because this is not a right- These groups started to lose members in 2021. Whether it was because of mass deplatforming from Parler and other online cesspools for the far right, or because the group splintered after leader Enrique Tarrio was outed as an FBI informant, the Proud Boys and groups like them could not and did not build the same sized audience on Telegram as they had achieved just a year earlier on other platforms. But that seemingly downward trend is a very small part of the story. Not only have public shows of force by the far right increased, not only do already white supremacist police forces get infiltrated by even more extremist group members, the overall trajectory of the far-right movement in the US in general has been growth. Massive growth. And the reason the far-right has grown so much is because it has successfully coalesced under a few key narratives that it has been able to mainstream in greater American political culture. The Proud Boys may not be what they used to, but it's because the American right as a whole has taken their place. Take a look at this clip, taken from a community meeting in Shasta County, California. And, and you better be happy that we're, we're good citizens, that we're peaceful citizens. But it's not going to be peaceful much longer, okay? And this isn't a threat. I'm not a criminal. I've never been a criminal. But I'm telling you that good citizens are going to turn into real concerned 
and revolutionary citizens real soon. And nobody else is going to say that. I'm probably the only person that has a ball to say what I'm saying right now. That we're building, we're organizing, and we'll work with law enforcement or without law enforcement. But you won't stop us when time comes because our families are starving. And if you don't hear the seriousness of my voice, I hope you open your ears and you absolutely listen to what I'm saying. Because this is a warning for what's coming. It's not going to be peaceful much longer. It's not going to be raw raw. It's not going to be speeches. It's not going to be gathering outside saying a pledge of allegiance. It's not going to be waving flags. It's going to be real. When you see the things that I've seen, I went to war for this country. I've seen the ugliest, dirtiest part of humanity. I've been in combat, and I never want to go back again. But I'm telling you what, I will to save this country. If it has to be against our own citizens, it will happen. And there's a million people like me, and you won't stop us. Open the county. Let our citizens do what they need to do. Let owners of businesses do what they need to do to feed their families. Take the masks off. That's a pretty troubling discourse, and as tempting as it might be to see this as a brief insight into a small movement, there's good evidence that the man in the video is just the most vocal part of the new American right. There's good evidence these beliefs aren't limited to militias with goofy names. They're an integral part of the conservative mob. Just take this statistic from the GWU program on extremism. Only around 13% of those charged in the Capitol riots were formal members of militant groups like the Proud Boys, the Three Percenters, and the Oath Keepers. The remaining 87% were a mix of typical Trump supporters and independent far-right extremists, there with their friends and family or lone attendees defined as inspired believers. That means most people who breached the Capitol were just average Republicans. And you can tell, these rioters just don't look like the typical far-right extremist. They are much older, with around two-thirds being over 35 years old, much less likely to be unemployed, and a full 14% of the attendees charged were business owners, and 30% were white-collar workers. These are not the typical far-right extremist demographics. These are just Republican constituency demographics. All that to say that the mainstream Republican Party has not only swept the violent far-right under its wing, it is comfortable embodying it itself. Okay, how did this happen? What are the narratives that have made their way out of smaller far-right cells and into common right-wing discourse? There are some you're probably already expecting, like the belief the election was stolen. That is a big one, and around 60% of the Republican Party does hold that to be true. To be fair, Trump spent months, and at this point over a year, hitting them over the head with that one, so it might not be the best example of a small group's narrative making it big. A more concrete example of that phenomenon is the QAnon conspiracy. One in four Republicans buy into the QAnon conspiracy theory that a group of Satan-worshipping, cannibalistic, blood-sucking pedophiles is ruling the US government. Plenty of people have looked into the movement's anti-Semitic tropes and its close proximity to neo-Nazi and white supremacist groups, so I won't spend more time on it here. But there's that. 25%. The more unexpected narrative making waves and bringing back that classic fascist flavor to the Republican Party is the Great Replacement Theory. By the way, this is probably a good time to mention this video definitely isn't making it through the algorithm. So if you feel inclined, my Patreon is in the description. Anyway, the Great Replacement Theory is a classic among neo-fascists, and it's pretty clear why. Put to paper in 2012 by French writer Renaud Camus, nope, wrong Camus, this is the guy, the Great Replacement asserts that there is a plot, which really means they think it's a Jewish thing, that the white race and white culture, whatever that is, is disappearing because of immigration from majority non-white countries. Fascists, and I really do mean fascists here, believe this will bring some general persecution of white people. Because of course they can't imagine the world being run any differently than with one race subjugating another, while at the same time believing wholeheartedly that racism ended with Obama. In any case, this is the theory that motivated the Christchurch shooter Brenton Tarrant and the El Paso shooter Patrick Crucius. And it's a big wet pile of fascist garbage that has, unsurprisingly, historical trajectory going straight from World War II through the American Nazi Party, Europe's own fascist politicians, and has now found a home among a substantial chunk of the Republican electorate. Here's a clip of Tucker Carlson endorsing the theory on Fox, calling it by name and likening it to eugenics. An unrelenting stream of immigration, but why? Well, Joe Biden just said it, to change the racial mix of the country. That's the reason, to reduce the political power of people whose ancestors lived here 
and dramatically increase the proportion of Americans newly arrived from the third world. And then Biden went further. He said that non-white DNA is the, quote, source of our strength. Imagine saying that. This is the language of eugenics. It's horrifying. But there's a reason Biden said it. In political terms, this policy is called the Great Replacement, the replacement of legacy Americans with more obedient people from faraway countries. They brag about it all the time, but if you dare to say it's happening, they will scream at you with maximum hysteria. That is America's most watched conservative casually parroting an openly white supremacist theory on primetime TV. But what does this have to do with January 6th? According to UChicago professor Robert Papp, between 4 and 8%, or around 21 million Americans at the high end, believe both 1. that the election was stolen, and that 2. Trump should be reinstated by force. Of that group, 63% believe in the Great Replacement Theory, almost 10% more than believe in QAnon, whose flags we saw waved throughout the crowd on January 6th and at every Trump rally for over a year. Let me say that again. More people in that crowd hold a deeply fascist belief than believe in the other slightly more wacky letter of the alphabet based fascist belief. And we know that the Q crowd was a big part of the Trump fan base to start off with because they're just so open about it. The great replacement crowd is just not waving as many flags. It is 18 more letters than a big Q though. Anyway, more than just getting some demographic information, Papp was able to estimate that, among all other motivations, a belief in the Great Replacement was the most significant trigger that turned people already convinced that the election was stolen into people who believed that they should engage in insurrectionist violence to reinstate Trump. In other words, the belief that white people are being replaced is the motivator that justified the riots for its perpetrators. And with these narratives making their way to the most watched conservative TV show and to regular conservative conferences since January 6th, we might be in for an even worse time going forward. But the QAnon and Great Replacement stuff isn't the whole picture. In the last year, opposition to vaccine and mask mandates have functioned in much the same way, rallying together the various strands of the American far right to the somewhat more moderate Republican base and infusing a more authoritarian tone into their discourse. The idea that the whole pandemic is some sort of hoax, just like they believe the election to be, has invited fascist extremists into what we recently called the mainstream currents of republicanism, who brought with them their horrifying views of what politics should be. Fascists, and more generally awful far-right extremists, are welcomed into the republican fold. But in making this video, I want to be careful that it doesn't seem like this is something new. It's certainly very bad, much more explicit today than it has been in years, and tainted with a much more military and violent shade than before. But fascism in this country has existed in some way for decades, if not centuries. The conservative wing of the American political establishment, often joined in its mission by the more progressive wing with only a few years of delay, has found in its electorate enough political will to push forward nationalism, xenophobia, racism, and the glorification of white religious culture at the very least since the Reagan era. And this country as a whole has engaged in genocidal racial violence for the majority of its history. It has always embraced more authoritarian, less democratic rule. It has always glorified its hegemonic role in the international sphere. It has always, in part or in whole, condoned its national project against racial and religious minorities and against every political movement to its left the Capitol riots, Charlottesville a couple years ago. Moments like these were significant. They were marks of the change in fascism's presentation. But by no means were they catalysts of fascism or flukes we can easily ignore. Because even if we understand the kinds of narratives that bring fascist ideology into a more prominent role today, those narratives are still just the last step before mainstream acceptance. Their emergence in far-right cells and compatibility with the greater conservative currents had to come from somewhere. And they did. Today, fascism has been driven to its current apex not by those narratives alone, but by the failures of the neoliberal era. Failures that have been building for decades and that have laid a fertile ground for fascism to take root. The economic insecurity that has fallen on more and more shoulders. The general decline of unionized labor the disappearance of jobs that entire cities were built on, and the increasing pace of economic crises have resulted in a particularly unstable system that fewer and fewer people have faith in. 
That has opened up the space for opportunistic figures all too happy to make sure the capitalist economy endures, even if it means a descent into authoritarian ultranationalism. Figures who have tried to portray moments like the Trump presidency as a departure from what brought us here in the first place, when it was really just a natural next step for a fragile, crisis-ridden capitalist economy. That's so dumb. That makes no sense. How could that be? That's you. That's what you're saying right now. I can hear you. I can see you. I know you're confused. If only you had an ongoing 12-part series on fascism and its modern forms to help you understand it better. Oh, wait, you do. You can watch the first episode of my series, The New F-Word, on Nebula. We're working on the next episode as we speak, so stay tuned for that. I'm really proud of what we've produced so far. In the meantime, if you'd like to help support content like this and my very time-consuming fascism series, consider becoming a patron on Patreon. As you can probably imagine, when I made the switch to producing political content, I started getting demonetized way more often, and most of my sponsors bailed. It's understandable, but because of this, I'm having to rely more heavily on viewers like you. If you like the kind of videos I'm producing, and you're able to chip in even a dollar a month, I would greatly appreciate the support. As a little show of that appreciation, every patron, regardless of donation amount, gets early access to every video, plus access to our patrons-only Discord server. We actually just dropped a major update to the Discord, and there are some really cool new features. We've got everything from a recommended reading list, to a book club, to special channels for our neurodivergent and LGBT comrades. We also have fun medal rolls for people who complete the server challenges. We've built a great little community, and we'd love for you to be part of it. So, if you'd like to help support my channel, join the Discord, and get early access to every video, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash secondthought. If you enjoyed this video, consider dropping a like. If you hated it, a thumbs down. You can check out my previous videos by clicking the links on your screen. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.